Good evening, friends, and welcome again to another Revelation of Peace Bible Prophecy Seminar. We're so glad that you're here with us. I'm going to look here on my live chat to see who we have. Uh, we want to go all the way back up. Wow, we have a lot of people already. Fantastic. Welcome, Tony and, and Daisy. We're so glad you're here. And Susie, Noel, so glad uh, that you are here. And, uh, and Donna, welcome. Carmen, Howard, so glad that you guys are here. Thanks for joining us. Um, many, many others that are here. Uh, we want to welcome you. And wherever you're at, whether in your living room or your kitchen or maybe your car, you're joining this live stream. And even though we physically can't be together, by God's grace, spiritually, we can be. So we're glad that you are here. Uh, again, I know I'm saying this every evening, but wanted to let our viewers know that we are doing our best to follow local protocols during this pandemic that we're in. We're praying for all those that are working hard uh, on the front lines. And if you would turn this camera around, I can assure you that no one else is here. I'm here by myself and we'll continue uh, to pray for the situation that we're in. We encourage you to record your attendance. You can do that one of two ways. The first is by putting your registration number there into the YouTube live chat. In order to do that, you do need a Gmail account. Uh, and if you already have that, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but if you don't, that's all right. You can just text the word present on your phone. So you don't want to put this in the live chat, but take your phone and text uh, present to 50597. Uh, that's the uh, phone number, and we'll record your attendance. And the reason why we want you to record your attendance is because we want to give away a free Bible. I have some uh, sitting right here, and it's a New King James Bible. It's a regular Bible. However, at the end of the Bible, at the very back, there's some beautiful study guides that go over a lot of the same topics we're talking about. I think it would be a blessing for your library. So after 10 nights of attending this, um, we'll send you, uh, send you a Bible. And in addition, if you attend all presentations each night, uh, we want to give you a Bible Prophecy 101 course certificate just for you. We also encourage you to sign up for a online Bible studies. You can do that by texting on your phone the same number, 50597, but instead uh, text Bible 2020. So don't put it in the live chat, but text on your phone, Bible 2020. We'll get you signed up for some free online Bible studies. Several of you have already done that. We encourage more of you to do it as well. All right, we have two uh, great giveaways this evening. The first is a beautiful Daniel and Revelation magazine. This magazine has excellent graphics, and it presents clearly uh, what we're talking about as well. And uh, that way you have it right there in a beautiful magazine. So this is a great resource. I'm excited to give this away. And then we have a great resource for families, for kids. Uh, maybe if you don't have a kid and you win this, you can give it away to maybe a niece or nephew or, or one of your grandchildren. Um, and it's called Character Building Stories for, kid, uh, for Kids. Uh, my wife and I read this to our kids uh, at home. So those are two resources we want to give out. And let me look on here on my phone. All right. And we will uh, be getting this uh, shortly here. We have an awesome Revelation of Peace team uh, that is uh, uh, getting me these uh, registration numbers. Uh, let me think here. All right. Let me text uh, my team. And uh, while I, I'm waiting for that, um, uh, I want to go ahead and tell you about some uh, upcoming nights. Um, we'll come back to the giveaway in just a minute. Tomorrow night, there's a powerful presentation where we're going to get to the heart of Revelation about an issue that you will have to make a stand on in the last days. And come tomorrow night. Uh, this is basically part two to tonight's message, and I'm excited about tomorrow night at 7 p.m. And then Thursday evening, we're going to look at the Bible and you're going to tell me who the Antichrist is. That's right. I'm not going to tell you. We're going to look at 10 identifying marks. You're going to tell me exactly who the Antichrist power is and how it's relevant for us today. And then lastly, Friday evening, and I shouldn't say lastly, because there's some more presentations. We have presentations all the way lined up till next week, friends. So I'm excited about some more presentations. But Friday night, the longest time prophecy. Have you ever felt afraid of the judgment of God or maybe felt guilt before? We're going to study the longest time prophecy, and I believe that you will find peace, friends. So here we go. The uh, first um, resource that we want to give away 
is the Daniel Revelation magazine, and that is to 1080. 1080, 1080. Congratulations. We're so glad that you won this resource. We'll get in touch with you or you get in touch with us uh, about the best way to send this to you. And then the second resource is 2276. Congratulations, 2276, the character building stories for kids. And we'll figure out how to get that to you as well. So again, uh, congratulations. And we want to jump right into our presentation, The Rock That Will Not Roll. We have a lot of information. So it may go a little longer tonight, but stay with me here. I'm excited about what God has for us. Let's go ahead and bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, I want to thank you so much that we have the privilege and the opportunity to virtually gather together and study the Word of God. Father, you have given us the Bible. And Lord, my prayer is give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in this narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combining. Lord, that's the message of Scripture is the combination of your character of, of law and love, of grace and truth. So, Lord, guide us tonight as we study your word in your name. Amen. Praise God uh, for uh, the word of God. Isn't that right, friends? Here's my beautiful Bible that I love uh, and lots of uh, notes and underlining in that. I want to show you a picture from the day that I got married. I was so excited about uh, my wedding day, August 31, 2014, the day that my beautiful bride, Nikkel, actually voluntarily agreed to spend the rest of her life with me. I know it's a surprise that someone would actually voluntarily choose to do that. I was amazed at well as well, but, but I think she actually likes me, and she pretends to laugh at my jokes, which I greatly appreciate. And here is a picture of her singing to me at our wedding. And it was a surprise. You can't really see me very well, but I'm crying here in this picture. And the reason why is because my wife surprised me. I didn't know it, but she got up and sang one of our favorite songs, a song by Stephen Curtis Chapman called I Will Be Here. Beautiful song that meant a lot to me. And I was amazed that she went through all of that preparation for me. And the reason why was because she Love me. Love compels us to action. Love causes us to think about what the other person wants and what the other person needs. Friends, we learned last night that Jesus died on Calvary for our sins. We learned from the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. Do you remember that? Daniel chapter 9, the 70 week prophecy. Jesus died right on time. In the middle of the week, he was baptized in 27 AD. And then three and a half years later, he was. Uh, crucified on a cross. He was cut off for our sins. And notice what Paul says in this powerful statement in his book to the Corinthian church. For the love of Christ compels us. I love that word because we judge that thus, that if one died for all, then all died. What does the love of Christ compel us to? And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. The love of Christ compels us not to choose our way, but to choose God's way. I love how this uh, person said uh, it. He put it on his Twitter. I found this last year. The secret to my success, I tried it my way, then I tried it Yahweh. And so the question, friends, that we have tonight is, how do we know God's way? We want not just my way. We want Yahweh's. We want God's way. But a lot of people have the genuine question that I've had too before, how do we know how to please God, right? We want to please him. He died for us. We want to live for him. But what does that practically look like? Well, friends, we, I think, first of all, need to go back to the ancient wilderness uh, tabernacle or sanctuary. In Exodus chapter 25, verse 8, God's people, the Israelites, had just left Egypt. They had been slaves there for hundreds of years, and God, through Moses took them out of Egypt. They were going toward Canaan, and right in the middle of the desert, God said, build me a sanctuary so that I may dwell among them. God wanted a sanctuary to dwell among his people so that he could govern them. He wanted to be their king. He wanted to be their God. Notice uh, what uh, the Bible says next. According to all that I show you, build this sanctuary, 
after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of the furnishings, just so you shall make it. Friends, we're going to see that there is a heavenly sanctuary and that the pattern of the earthly sanctuary was made after the heavenly sanctuary. And as we go into the model of the sanctuary on earth, we learn what God's priorities are and how he governs his universe. Here is a picture of the wilderness sanctuary. You have the altar of sacrifice and the bronze laver and the holy place with the table of showbread and the altar of incense and the seven lamp candlestick. Then once a year, the high priest would go into the most holy place where God's Shekinah uh, glory dwelt. And inside the most holy place was the Ark of the Covenant. Wow, have you heard of the Ark of the Covenant? If you have heard of the Ark of the Covenant, just put into the live chat, yes. That's all you have to put, just yes. The Ark of the Covenant was a beautiful, glorious, gold-covered box. And what made it special was not just the fact that it had gold. We could make any golden box today, and it wouldn't be special or holy. What made it special or holy was that God's presence was there. And notice what was inside the Ark of the Covenant. Exodus 25, verse 16, it says, And you shall put into the ark the testimony which I shall give you. Now, I have a question, friends. If you know what the testimony is, write in the live chat what you think the testimony is. In the ark of the covenant was the testimony. What is the testimony? Put it in the live chat. Let's see if you can get the right answer. And let's see if you got it. Exodus 31, 18 tells us, And when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony. Maybe that gives you a clue. Two tablets. What were they made of? Tablets of stone. The Ten Commandments, written with the finger of God. That gives us the last clue, right? The Ten Commandments were right there in the Ark of the Covenant. Right there underneath the Ark of the Covenant. And friends, that tells us something about how God governs his universe. Notice this next passage in Exodus 25, verse 22. It's long, but stay with me. It says, there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat. God was going to speak to the Israelites from the Ark of the Covenant. From between the two cherubim, remember that angel that covered the Ark of the Covenant, the two angels, which are on the Ark of the Testimony about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. So, friends, God was going to use the Ark of the Covenant almost like a, a throne, like a throne, right? And, and actually, let's go there, and let's go to Psalm 80, verse 1. It says, Hear a shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who sit enthroned between the cherubim shine forth. So, God's people and God himself viewed the Ark of the Covenant like a throne. And God directed and guided and govern his people from his throne, from the sanctuary, from the Ark of the Covenant. And the way that we know how God operates, what his ways are, how he governs his uh, people is by the laws that were underneath the Ark of the Covenant, right? Any king, the way that we know how they operate is by the laws of the land. How do they govern their people? By their laws. And so, friends, if we want to know what God's ways are, we need to look to the law of God. Because Jesus is our king. He's the Lord of lords and king of kings, and we want to know what his ways are so that we can please him, right? Um, and notice, too, that the Bible doesn't just call it the Ark of the, the Covenant. They also call it the Ark of the Testimony or the Ark of the Ten Commandments. When we go to Revelation which is one of the primary books of our study. We're studying Daniel and Revelation during this series. We find out that the heavenly sanctuary is a prominent theme in the last book of the Bible. In Revelation, uh, we find, which is the very last book of the Bible, that the sanctuary is a very prominent theme. And it's uh, such a prominent theme that you can find in several chapters uh, uh, different word language or verbiage or pictures that hearken back to the Old Testament sanctuary. In Revelation 1, we see a priest with candlesticks. That reminds us of the holy place. In Revelation 5, we see a slain lamb, which reminds us of the courtyard. Revelation 8, we see the trumpets and altar of incense, which again makes us think of the, uh, the holy place. And then the Ark of the Covenant, we're going to read the verse in Revelation 11. It, uh, it, uh, it reminds us of the most holy place, right? And then Revelation 14 and 15, we find uh, God's 
uh, revelation or his people going out of the sanctuary. And we're, we'll talk about that uh, in, in just a little bit. But notice this, Dr. Tom Shepard, he is a New Testament scholar. And notice this interesting um, uh, uh, document that he's come up with, or pattern, I should say, that he's seen in the book of Revelation. And I know that's kind of confusing. There's a lot on here. Um, and maybe you can take a picture of it and, and um, uh, do some of your own study later. But what I want to highlight here is that right here in the middle of the book of Revelation is this great conflict. To a Hebrew mind, the middle was the most important. To our Western minds, we save the best for the last. If you read any book, oh, wait till the end, and then it gets interesting. But for a Hebrew, they had something called a chiastic structure. And in a chiasm, right, the middle of the document was the most important. So right here, we find this great con conflict or controversy between God and Satan. And friends, we're going to find out that that controversy was over God's law. Satan accused God that God's law, uh, that you couldn't keep it, that God wasn't fair, that it was impossible to keep his law. And God wanted to show that, no, it wasn't, right? It wasn't. That God is a just God, that he is a God of love, right? Notice Revelation eleven nineteen, 19, and notice what specifically uh, John the Revelator sees. It says, then God's temple in heaven was open, and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant, and there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a severe hailstone. In this vision, uh, John the Revelator, he sees, he sees the Ark of the Covenant, and there in the Ark of the Covenant we know was the law of God. Right, So a Hebrew mind instantly would have thought, not just the Ark of the Covenant, but the Ark of the Testimony. Here is where God spoke to his people. And even this language here, lightning and thunder and, and an earthquake, reminds us of Mount Sinai, right? When Moses went up to Mount Sinai, there was uh, thunder and lightning and, and the earth shook. And so right here we see that the law is one of the central issues in the heart of Revelation. Uh, notice this in Revelation 14, 12. We're going to look at this verse at the very end of the presentation as well. But God is looking for a people who keep his commandments. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. God needs a people. He longs for a people that can keep his commandments, that don't just halfway keep them, but keep them all the way. And you know what, friends? When you look at the book of Revelation, you find out that God doesn't, or excuse me, uh, the enemy does not like it when God's people are keeping the law. Notice this, Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. Now, now who's the dragon, friends? Who's the dragon? That's right. Let's read Revelation 12, 17. The great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. This dragon is Satan, is a representation of Satan. And he's upset at the woman. We're going to learn in future meetings that a woman in Bible prophecy represents God's people. A pure woman represents God's people. There's also a harlot woman in Revelation 17 that we're going to read about as well. But here is, in Revelation 12, is, is the pure woman, which represents God's people. All throughout the Old Testament, God used uh, a bride, right, or a, a woman to represent his people. And so here the, the devil is mad at the church. And this, the reason why he's mad is because they're keeping the, God, the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. He does not like it. He's upset with them that they are actually following God's law. Why is he uh, so mad that they're keeping uh, God's law? It's because, essentially, God's people are proving that Satan is a liar, right? They're showing that God actually is a God of love, that it is possible to keep his law. They, uh, God wants us to reveal his character, and we're going to find out that the law is a transcript of God's character as well. But, friends, I, I want to go a little deeper here because... We're going to find out that this issue of the commandments and the law 
is a huge issue in the end times, right? This is a revelation seminar. We're looking at Bible prophecy. And this issue of the Ten Commandments and the law is tied directly to end time Bible prophecy. It's a huge issue. And Paul is going to show us something that we actually looked at just a couple nights ago. Do you remember, uh, this was on Saturday night when we looked at a topic called the secret about the secret rapture. We find out, we found out that Paul said that there are two things that need to happen before Jesus comes back. Do you remember that? Let's go ahead and read this again. It says, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. And notice the next verse, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So here Paul says there's two things that need to happen before Jesus comes back. The first is that there needs to be a great falling away or an apostasy. That's key, friends, because we can expect an apostasy in the Christian church, right? An apostasy is inside the church, not outside. We can expect an apostasy of falling away inside the church before Jesus comes back. And we should also expect the man of sin to appear. But notice what Paul calls the man of sin in the following verses. Verse 8, he calls him, and then the lawless one will be revealed. In verse 9, he calls him the same thing, the coming of the lawless one. So Paul calls him the man of sin, the son of perdition. This is the Antichrist power. Thursday night, we're going to be talking about this. He calls him the lawless one. Now, why would he call the Antichrist power the lawless one? Well, friends, we're going to be looking at this specific chapter on Thursday night. So you can read Daniel 7 ahead of time if you would like. But this is talking about the Antichrist. And for right now, you're going to have to trust me until Thursday night. But this is talking about the Antichrist. And notice what the Antichrist intends to do. He shall speak pompous or blasphemous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change what? Times and law. The Antichrist power intends to, tries to, attempts to change God's law. Notice here, talking about the same power, the Antichrist power, he casts truth down to the ground. He's the lawless one. He casts truth down to the ground. He attempts to change God's law. So, friends, the Antichrist power is uh, the lawless one, right? The law of God is a huge issue. But before you say, well, this is just a problem that the Antichrist has. This is not a problem that I have. Notice what Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2.7. He says, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Wow. Paul recognizes that the mystery of lawlessness that lawless behavior going against God's moral law was already happening in his day and would continue to increase and increase until the Antichrist was revealed, and then it would increase even more. What we're going to find, friends, is that this lawlessness is actually happening here today. Notice what Jesus said. This is fascinating, friends. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23 not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Jesus here is talking not to the outside, but to the inside. He's talking to religious leaders. He's talking to the church people of his day, right? The Pharisees. They were the religious leaders of the day. And he's telling them, you know what? This is a problem. And something you'll notice, friends, is that Often in Scripture, prophecy doesn't just address those on the outside, right? Those that don't know God, the secular, the atheist. He actually is more interested in his own people. God is calling out the sins of his people before he calls out anyone else's sins. And this passage is aimed directly at God's people. Why? Because they're not doing the will of God. That is the issue, friends. They're not doing God's will. And the reason this is important is because Jesus, I think, is telling his people that 
Yes, I give you grace, but how you behave still matters. Notice what he says next. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? These people have done all sorts of things for God. But notice what Jesus tells them next. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Wow. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. This is the same Greek word that Paul uses talking about the Antichrist. But here Jesus doesn't apply this to the Antichrist power. He applies it to people inside the church. He recognizes that this lawlessness issue is going to increase more and more until he comes back. And friends, the reason this is important is that you can preach a good sermon. You can do great things. You can uh, feed the, the homeless, right? You can put on a, a good show, but that doesn't mean that you're a follower of God. What makes you a follower of God is doing God's will, is following his law. Now, I want to ask you a, 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 maybe a difficult question tonight, and that is this question right here on the screen. Has lawlessness crept into the Christian faith? That's a, a tough question, right? Remember, most of prophecy is directed to God's own people, not people outside, but people inside the church. And has lawlessness crept into the church? When the Bible predicts a falling away and apostasy, he's talking about the church. And so this question, I think, is an important question for, for us to answer, especially if we're the last day generation. And we're not really talking about, friends, does such and such a church or such and such a preacher preach lawlessness? We're talking about me and we're talking about you. Has lawlessness crept into my own life? Notice this, friends. This was a Gallup poll that was taken fairly recently. They found out some interesting facts about Christians. There's very little difference in the behavior of the churched and unchurched on a wide range of items, including lying, cheating, and stealing. Wow. Basically, they found out that Christians were not all that different than secular people when it came to cheating and lying and stealing. Maybe you've heard before that the rate of divorce inside the church is the same outside the church. So maybe all those things we've heard about, well, Christians are hypocrites, maybe, friends, it's true. Maybe lawlessness has crept into our own lives. And so the question that I have tonight is, is where do some Christians get the idea that it's okay to sin, to trample on God's law? Isn't that a good question, friends? When's it okay to come in conflict, conflict with God's moral law, the way that we live? And really, friends, I'm asking about my own life or your life. Have we gone comfortable with sin? Because God says that sin will actually prohibit us from seeing God. Sin will prohibit us getting into the kingdom. We want to repent of that. We want our lives to be in accordance with God. Right? We want to please God. We want to say, God, come in. And the beautiful news is, is 1 John 1, 9 says that if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So to answer that question, when has this idea, uh, well, it's okay to sin, we can do whatever we want, when has that slipped into Christianity? And I don't have the exact answer to that question, but maybe this can help us. I found this recently from a popular book on prophecy, and, and the name of the book or the author doesn't really matter because you can find this same idea or concept in, in really a lot of Christian books. And notice what the author says. When he as God's only begotten son gave himself to die on the cross for the sins of the whole world, he ended the age of law and introduced the age of grace. Notice what he's saying here. From that time on, individuals have been able to be eternally saved through faith by repenting of their sins and calling on Christ to save him. That's why it's called the age of grace. Now, there's a little truth to this statement. I believe wholeheartedly that I can't be saved from my own works and that I am saved by putting my faith in Christ. Absolutely. 
But notice what he said earlier, that God ended the age of law and introduced the age of grace. In other words, he's implying, and I've seen this in a lot of Christian authorship, that God dealt differently with people in the Old Testament than he did in the New Testament. That somehow God changed his way of saving people that prior to the New Testament, you had to be saved by the law and keeping it and uh, sacrifices. But friends, we don't see that that's the case at all. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, we read that the blood of bulls and goats can't save us. When the Israelites sacrificed these animals, they knew that it couldn't save them. They knew that only Jesus could save them. In fact, notice this. Uh, it was said about Abraham in Romans. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. So notice Paul is saying, if Abraham was justified by works, but he wasn't. Notice what he said next. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Abraham believed in righteousness by faith. In fact, that, that concept comes very much from the Old Testament. We looked at, uh, I think it was the last, uh, not last night, but the previous presentation, that the gospel was in fact preached to Abraham. Abraham believed in God. He knew that God was able to save him. He couldn't save himself. So this concept of God doing things differently, that he somehow changes, I don't think is true, friends. In fact, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's always been the same God of love and mercy and truth and righteousness and justice. Notice this, friends, and I believe this will help answer our question, to the fact that there's not some different law of or, the, or age of the law that God dealt with differently as people in the past, but he's dealt with his people the same all the way through. Notice this, friends. God is spiritual, and also the law is spiritual. And I encourage you to, to again, take a screenshot of this, or I, I, I want you to look up all these verses. Here's your homework before now and tomorrow night, to look up all these different verses and compare what God is like and his law is like. And you're going to find out, friends, that the law is a transcript of God's character. It's the same as, as who God is. God is spiritual. His law is spiritual. God is love. His law is love. God is truth, the Bible says, and his law is truth. God is righteous. His law is righteous. God is holy. His law is holy, the Bible says. The Bible says that God is perfect and his law is perfect. God stands forever. His law stands forever. God is good. His law is good. God is just. His law is just. God is pure. His law is pure. God is unchangeable, and his law is unchangeable. God has dealt the same way. He has governed his people strictly by love throughout eternity. 1 John 4, 8 says that God is love. And the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, have operated their government by love from the very beginning, friends. And so... What God does, his law, is simply the outworking of his character and heart. So we want to go over four misunderstandings about the law of God to try to clear up some misconceptions and some myths about the law. And I think this will help us figure out one of Satan's greatest deceptions in these last days. The first misunderstanding is that the law is irrelevant and legalistic. Have you heard that? That... Any keeping of the law, that the law is, is almost bad, right? It's not relevant for us today. But friends, I'm going to suggest to you, and I hope that I can convince you of this by the myriad of Bible texts to support this, that God's law is not burdensome, but God's law is a blessing. In fact, 1 John 5, 3 says that exact same thing. For this is the love of God. What is the love of God? That we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. I love that word picture there, right? Have you ever carried something really heavy and, oh, it's, it's, it's tough to carry, right? It's not burdensome. Just this morning, my wife was on a run, and she likes to get exercise as many mornings as possible, and she was out on a run, and she noticed that an older gentleman um, was really hunched over, uh, hunched over you know, almost halfway, and, and you could tell there was something wrong with his back, and, and he was carrying these three big bags of grocery. It was a burden. And you know what my sweet wife did? She said, hey, sir, 
uh, is there any way I could carry your groceries for you? And she helped him carry his groceries home and, and let him know that we were praying for him. If there's anything that we could do, he could definitely let us know. And, and this man told my wife that uh, she, or that he had just lost his, his wife a few weeks ago um, and that uh, he was sad. And so that was an opportunity to be a blessing, right? And God's law is a blessing, right? It's not a, it's not a burden. It's a blessing. Proverbs 29, 18 says, does it say, sad is he who keeps, if you keep the law, it's, oh, you're going to be so sad. No, it says, happy is he who keeps the law. You keep God's law, it's going to give you joy. And friends, we need joy in today's earth, don't we? In today's uh, day and age. Notice this, I love this, John 14, 15. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. We don't keep God's commandments out of a burden, but because we love him, right? When I married my wife, I said, wow, I want to do what she wants on her birthday, on our anniversary, right, all the time. I want to please her, and she wants to please me. Do we slip up sometimes? Do we become selfish? Absolutely, right? We all do. But God is giving us strength every day to help us be more and more like him. And one of the best ways to let someone you know that you love them is by doing what they want to do. John 15, 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So our love is communicated through action, right? I love this little poem that I heard once. It said, I love your hugs and I love your kisses, but I love it best when you do the dishes, right? Can I get an amen from either the men or the women out there, the husband or wife? Right? We all appreciate helping each other around the house. And friends, if I came home and all that I did was sat on the couch and watch TV, or all that I did was get on my phone and I never even looked up at my wife and I never helped change a diaper and I never helped put the kids to bed, right? that's not love. Right? Even if I said all the time, I love you, I love you, I love you, sweetie. No, love is communicated through action. In fact, I, I saw one little sign. You can buy it on Amazon. It says, no husband was ever shot while doing the dishes, right? Our love is communicated through action. 1 John 2, 3, and 4 says, Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandment. How do you know God? Right? If someone said, do you know God? You might think, yeah, I know him, but they could say, well, are you keeping his commandments? Notice the next verse, a little strong language. It says, he who says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. Wow, and the truth is not in him. So as a Christian, if you say, yes, Jesus is my Savior, but you're not following the word of God and you're not keeping his commandments, then look at what John says. Wow, that's powerful language, friends. And I love this. This is how Jesus describes the law. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. So love God is the first commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So the best way, friends, to describe the Ten Commandments is by loving God and loving people. And the first four commandments have to do with loving God. The last six commandments have to do with loving people. And why don't we take just a minute to actually look at the Ten Commandments. Maybe you memorized them as a kid, but, but I think there's principles here that sometimes people forget. The first commandment is you shall have no other gods before me. Uh, essentially, God is saying here, listen, if you put me first, I can satisfy all of your needs. If you include me on your decision making, I can satisfy the longings of your heart. Do you ever remember growing up as a kid and you had one of those toys and there was a triangle, little space, and a circle, and a square, and you had little pieces that could fit into those shapes, right? You had an actual triangle that fit into the triangle. And as a kid, you were trying to figure out different shapes, right? Well, someone put it once this way, that our heart is in the shape of God. And we try to fit different things into our heart. We try to fit money or wealth or power. Or we try to, to fit the things of, of, of this world, right? The different stuff, the cars and the toys and the latest technology. And we, we try to stuff that in and and see if that can satisfy us. But ultimately, it can't, friends. Only God can satisfy the true longings of your heart. So God says, put me first, and you will be happy. The second commandment, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. 
And notice this, friends. God is always with us. So we don't need an image to replace him, right? God is saying you don't need little charms or, or bracelets or things that, that uh, remind you of him or replace him. It's kind of like this, all right? Imagine, friends, um, here is uh, uh, my phone, right? And, and on my phone, you can kind of see it there in the background. Uh, can't really see it. But there on the back of my phone is a picture of my family, right? Now, when I'm gone on a trip, a business trip, Right? I have this picture, and I see them, and I say, ah, oh, praise God that here's my family, right, when I'm away from them. But when I'm in their presence, imagine if I go home, and I get home from a long trip, and my family comes up to me, oh, Dad, oh, Jeff, we're so glad you're here. And I bring out my phone, and I mm, start kissing the picture when they're right in front of me. Wouldn't that be weird, right? When I am with my family, I don't need the picture. And friends, God says in his word that he is always with us. He never leaves us. So friends, we don't need an idol, an image, or an icon because those things distract us. Sometimes we rely more on that than God himself. God wants us to know that he is always there. Notice number three. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. God says, you know what? I want you to trust me, so respect my name. Imagine, friends, if I go around the neighborhood, right? If I go around uh, Redlands or, or Loma Linda or Mentone or Ukaipa, if I go around and I tell everyone about my, my wife and I make fun of her, right? Oh, my wife, did, is that respecting her? Of course not, right? I don't make fun of my wife around other people. I uplift her and, and I encourage her, right? I, I tell her people how amazing she is. And God wants us to do the same, not to use his name just flippantly here and there. And some people, sadly, the only time that they actually use God's name is when they hit their thumb with a, with, a, with a hammer, right? Oh, my G-O-D. God says, you know what? Use my name respectfully. Treat me like you love me, right? And if we do that, friends, it'll give us true joy. Uh, I love this one. The fourth commandment says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. God wants to go on a date with you every single week. Isn't that beautiful? God wants to actually spend time with you. So he says, hey, meet me with me on a regular basis. Meet with me on my appointed day every single week. When you follow the rhythms of heaven, you will find rest for your soul, friends. Here's the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother. God obviously wants uh, the home to be a, a source of joy, right? And I know, friends, I know from experience that when I honor my parents, as I think about my childhood, and when my kids obey their parents, man, it brings so much joy, right? When we honor our parents and take care of them. Right now, um, I'll share with you uh, some news. You can pray for my grandpa right now. My grandpa, uh, is, is, his health is not doing well. He has some challenges. And my mom is there on a regular basis. They live uh, not too far from us. And, and she's going there as often as she can to be with her dad, right? Honor your father and mother. Number six, you shall not murder. Right, that's pretty obvious that if we don't murder people, that's going to bring us joy, right? Love people. But God actually takes us a step further, right? When Jesus came, he expanded this and said it's not just physically taking someone's life. He says, you've heard it said that of those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. So in fact, friends, when we are just angry with someone else and we're mad at them, that actually lowers our joy. Notice this interesting study that when you have gratitude, right, when you're filled with joy and you love other people, it actually changes you. A 2003 study compared the well-being of participants who kept a weekly list of things they were grateful for. Instead of being angry, right, they kept a weekly list of things they were grateful for to participants who kept a list of things that irritated them. So notice, here's two different groups. One group kept a list of all the things they were thankful for. I'm thankful for my job and my health. I'm thankful that I have a family. I'm thankful for Jesus. The other group actually kept a list of things that irritated them. Oh, right? Maybe it's the same thing. My job irritates me or my family, right? And notice what they found out. The researchers showed that gratitude-focused participants exhibited increased well-being, and they concluded that a conscious focus on blessings may have emotional and interpersonal benefits. So friends, God's law about, hey, don't be angry with people, have joy, right? Have gratitude for those around you. 
That has proven scientifically that it actually can increase your happiness. I love this one, number seven, you shall not commit adultery, be sexually pure. Friends, in the day and age that we're living in, God is asking his people to save your intimacy for marriage. Don't sleep around with anyone. Don't sleep with someone before marriage. Save it for that intimate, special union between a husband and wife, right? The, the media gives a completely different message but did the media create our bodies? No, God did. Our creator knows what will bring us the most joy. I love this, uh, this, this, this uh, same thought from Jesus, right? Jesus, again, expands on, on, uh, on this commandment. And it's not just in marital relations that he's talking about. Notice what he says. You've heard that it was said to those of old, don't commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman or man to lust for her or him has already committed adultery with them in their heart. So notice, friends, that Jesus and God are saying, you know what? A couple is going to be so happy if they save the, that intimate, uh, romantic feelings for marriage. Isn't that beautiful, friends? Uh, notice this. I love uh, Ty Gibson. He's a favorite author of mine. And he says this about that union. He says, intimacy with one person for life creates a psychological environment that creates the, or that increases the couple's capacity for total person flourishing, including a heightened capacity for love. There's a lot of wisdom to the intuitive pop proverb, don't waste sunsets on people who will be gone by sunrise. Monogamy isn't the smaller view, right? That's marriage between one man and woman for life. Is, isn't the smaller view in, uh, of pleasure or and pleasure. It's the larger view. It's the view that takes in the whole person and all of their tomorrows. Beautiful. That science, all right, backs up. And I wish I had more time to explain some of that. Science actually backs up, friends, that uh, the, the increased joy that a couple will have while saving all of that for marriage, friends. And God says that right there in his law. A law number eight says you shall not steal. I think we know this is pretty obvious, right? If you steal my stuff, that's not going to bring my joy. If I steal your stuff, it won't bring you joy. Respect other people's stuff. That's obvious. That brings us joy. Number nine, be honest with people. Don't bear false witness. Notice this uh, study that was done. I found this article a couple of years ago in the New York Times, how honesty could actually make you happier. Research from the University of Notre Dame has shown that when people consciously stop telling lies, including white lies, for 10 weeks, they had fewer physical ailments like headaches, fewer mental health complaints like symptoms of depression than a control group that did not focus on honesty. Wow. Try that for uh, how, how long was it, right? For 10 weeks. Don't tell any even white lies. Focus on honesty for a few months. You're going to find that you're going to have less headaches, right? That you uh, will actually feel better. Isn't that powerful? Science backing up God's word, because God is a God of love. Notice this last one, you shall not covet. Be content with how God made you. I think this one is so important for us today, friends, because we live in what one author called an OCD culture. Not obsessive, uh, obsessive, uh, uh, I even forgot, friends, um, I'm glad that I make mistakes sometimes, right? Uh, what she called OCD, right? Not obsessive compulsive disorder, there we go, but obsessive comparison disorder. Not obsessive compulsive disorder, but she says we live in a culture of obsessive comparison. We're always comparing ourselves with others. And notice this study, right? Uh, this global study was in 2017. 57% said after going on social media, they felt that someone they follow has a better life than they do. Have you ever done that? You've gone on Facebook and you say, man, that, it's not fair. They have a nicer house and they have a nicer family, right? We live in this culture of comparison. 59% felt sad after they saw photos from a party they didn't get to attend. Man, why didn't I get invited, right? And notice this, 45% were unhappy after seeing photos from a friend's happy holiday outing. We live in this comparison culture that said, man, what does that person have? And God, from the very beginning, says, be content with how I made you. And friends, Jesus can help us be content. So notice Psalm 48, I delight to do your will, oh my God, your law is within my heart. The law is not burdensome, it is a blessing. 
Misunderstanding number two, we went over misunderstanding one, that the law is irrelevant and that it is legal, it's not legalistic or irrelevant, it's a blessing, right? The misunderstanding two is that we live under grace, so we don't have to keep the law. Have you heard that before? We live in the age of grace, so we don't have to keep the law anymore. And often the verse that is used is Romans 6, 14, and 15. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under law, but under grace. There you go, Jeff. We live not under uh, the law anymore. We live under grace, so we don't have to keep the law anymore. But friends, I want to ask you a question. You don't have to answer in the live chat. I won't call you out like that. But how many of you have ever gotten pulled over? Oh, oh, you saw my hand. I've gotten pulled over before too, right? And imagine if you're going 75 miles per hour in a 55 mile per hour zone. You see the flashing lights in the mirror and you get that uh, sick feeling in your stomach that maybe you know all too well. Hopefully you don't. And you get pulled over. You roll down the window. You have your documents ready. And the police officer... Uh, comes over. And let's pretend for a moment that he's in a really good mood and we'll say that it's his birthday. And he says, you know what? I'm going to give you a warning. And in fact, friends, that's happened to me before. I've gotten a warning before. and uh, You breathe a big sigh of relief. Now, friends, I want to tell you something. When you have that warning, are you still under the law? A absolutely, friends. You're under the law because you got pulled over, right? You were going faster, but you were given grace, right? So now that you've give, give, given a pardon, so to speak, you've been given grace, but does that mean, friends, that after you've been given grace, you just go and do whatever you want? Oh, you know what? I got pardoned that first time. Let me just go off and speed. No, of course not. In fact, I'll tell you something, friends. A while back, I got pulled over. We're going a little too fast down a hill. And I was given a warning. And you know what, friends? Every single time I go through that zone now, I make sure to stop. So living under grace doesn't say I don't want to keep the law. In fact, it inspires me to keep the law even more. So you're not under law but under grace. Notice the very next verse. Sometimes we forget the next verse. It says, what then? Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? Certainly not. So friends, of, of course, the, we need to keep the law. We don't want to sin because we're under grace. No, we actually want to uh, keep the law even more. The law shows us the character of God, but it doesn't just show us the character of God. It also shows us ourself. Notice this, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. Okay, notice James' illustration. What we're talking about is that the law doesn't just show us who God is. It also shows us who we are. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, that, that mirror, and continues in it and is not forgetful here but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. James tells us, friends, that the law of God is like a mirror. And I want to do a, a little simple illustration. I'll try to do this quickly that hopefully will explain what I'm talking about. That the law of God is, is like a mirror. So stay with me here, friends. And I know that we're live on camera, but we're going to attempt to do this illustration. All right. So just one minute. <clears throat> so, friends, I was... Uh, painting my, my house uh, just a little bit ago, and, and uh, you know, I, I got into some paint, right? Why are you guys laughing? Oh, what? Are, are you guys laughing at me? Why are you laughing? You know what? I don't know why you're laughing at me, but I'm going to actually, I'm, I need a mirror right now, all right? Here we go. Ah, I get it now why you guys are laughing. I have paint right here on my cheek, all right? Imagine, friends, if you were painting your room, and you got some paint on yourself, and you go to the mirror and you say, ah, I have paint on myself. Now, question, friends. Does the mirror scrub off the paint, right? Can I go to the mirror and, oh, scrub, scrub, scrub? Does that get away the paint? Of course not. The purpose of the mirror isn't to remove the paint. I need a, a washcloth or a wipe, right? And because um, I have kids, we always have 
lots of wipes handy, okay? And here we go. I still need the mirror to, uh, to see this here. And uh, I'm going to wipe that off. And I actually have two wipes just in case here. All right, there we go. I got off the paint off my face by a wet little uh, a rag here, right, uh, by a wipe. So notice, friends, that James says that the law of God is like a mirror. The purpose of the mirror isn't to wipe stuff off my face, but it's to let me know that I have it on my face. But the wet washcloth itself, the wipe, that's what gets it off. And friends, in the same way, through the law of God, we have knowledge of our mistakes. We see our paint, right? Those are all our sins. When we look into the law of God, like this little boy here, he sees, wow, I've messed up. I've made mistakes. And he sees all the things that he should be doing. But that's not going to cleanse him of his sin. He needs the blood of Jesus to cleanse him from his sin. He needs Jesus to wipe away all of his sins, friends. That's why Romans 3.20 says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Notice what he says, that we're not going to be justified by the deeds of the law. You keeping the law won't save you, friends, but there's an important purpose of the law. By the law is the knowledge of sin. Uh, maybe you've heard this illustration before, but uh, and it's used uh, in different contexts. Uh, but imagine, friends, there was a village. And in this village, there was a cliff at the edge of the village, at the edge of the village, and there were all, they always had problems with this cliff. They went uh, right down to maybe the, the ocean or maybe down to a road down there. And, and different times, right, kids would be playing and they would fall off and injure themselves or, or maybe uh, in the dark, right, a, a stranger to the city was coming through and he would fall off the cliff. And, and so at their city council meeting, they would have arguments about whether they needed a fence or an ambulance. There was one group that said, listen, you know what, we just need to put a fence up to protect people from going over the edge. But there was another group that said, you know what, we need an ambulance at the bottom, right? We don't want a fence to obstruct the beautiful view that people have from our, our village. That's the only reason people come here. We don't want a fence. Let's put an ambulance at the, bottom, at the bottom in case people mess up. And in the same way, friends, the law is like a fence, right? And some people say, well, you know what, we don't need the law anymore, right? We just need Jesus to save us. But the law protects people from going over the edge. And we can imagine that the city council, they said, you know what, we need both. We, let's put a fence at the top, right, to prevent people from going over the edge. But in case someone is rebellious or, or maybe mistakenly they go over, we'll have in an emergency case. And you know what John says? He says, you know what, I write these things to you so that in case you do sin, you have an advocate, right? Jesus saves us from our sin. That doesn't inspire us to jump over the cliff again, but it says, you know what? No, I, the, the, I see the fence now. I don't want to go over and injure myself again. The third misunderstanding of the law is that the law was done away with and nailed to the cross. Have you heard that before? The law was done away with and nailed to the cross. Well, Jesus says that the law wasn't done away with. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my law will not pass away. Jesus says his law doesn't pass away. It's always there. It's beautiful. It's been there from the very beginning, and it's not a burden, but a blessing. And then notice this about that same uh, concept. The law is nailed to the cross. That actually phrase is from the Bible. It says Colossians 2.14, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements. What is that? We'll talk about that. That was against us, which was contrary to us. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. There we go. The handwriting of requirements was nailed to the cross. Or maybe you've read this verse in Ephesians, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. There we go. Jesus abolished the law. He nailed it to the cross. But friends, we have to remember when we're reading Paul's writings, and many Christians miss this, is that there are two laws that Paul speaks about. There's the moral law, referring to the Ten Commandments, and there's also... Notice this, the ceremonial law, right? The ceremonial law was all of the laws that were pointing forward to Jesus, that Moses gave his people, right? Like, build me a sanctuary, right? And uh, sacrifice animals on the altar. 
Right? We don't do those things now because those things pointed forward to Jesus. Those were nailed to the cross, but the moral law wasn't. Notice the difference between the moral law and ceremonial law. God's law was spoken by God, but the ceremonial law was spoken by a man, by Moses. Right? God's law was written by God in stone. The ceremonial law was written by Moses in a book, not in stone. God's law was placed inside the ark, Hebrews 9, 4. The ceremonial law was placed in, or excuse me, on the side of the ark. God's law inside, the ceremonial law on the outside. God's law was to stand forever, but the ceremonial law, like we just read, was actually uh, ended at the cross. So there's a difference between those two different types of laws. Misunderstanding number four, and this one is important, friends, because a lot of people have this understanding. We've already cleared this up, I think, but just in case we haven't, misunderstanding number four is that keeping the law saves you. That if I perform certain requirements, if I do certain things, then that means that God loves me more. And friends, that can't be farther from the truth. Notice this powerful passage in the book of Ephesians. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Friends, I am so thankful tonight. I am so thankful, friends, that the God of the universe says, I love you and I care about you. I'm so thankful that the God of the universe says, I died on a cross for your sins. I'm so thankful, friends, that when I look in the mirror of the law, when you look in the mirror of the law, maybe, friends, you see your past mistakes. Maybe you see all your broken promises. Maybe you see all of the harm that you've done to other people. Maybe you see the impatience that you've spoken or that you've had with your kids. Or maybe the, the uh, impatient word you've spoken with your spouse. You become discouraged as you look at the law. But then... Jesus points your eyes away from the law to Jesus. And he says, you know what, my child, look to me because I can save you. I can save you, friends. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. And notice this next verse, friends. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So good works don't save us, right? They're not the bridge to salvation. They're the fruitage of salvation. Did you catch that? Good works are not the bridge to salvation, but they're the result or fruitage of salvation. I love how Protestant reformer Martin Luther said it. He said, our good works do not generate righteousness. Rather, our righteousness in Christ generates good works. Isn't that beautiful? I want to read it one more time. Our good works do not generate righteousness, but rather our righteousness in Christ generates good works. Friends, Jesus wants to give you his righteousness by faith. And friends, one of my favorite stories in the entire Bible is when Joshua the high priest is standing before Satan. You can find this, find this in the book of Zechariah. Joshua the high priest is standing before Satan, and Satan is standing at the right hand to accuse him, and that is the devil's name, accuser. That's what his name means, accuser. He is constantly accusing you, saying, you know what, I thought you were a Christian, I thought you were good enough. He was accusing Joshua the high priest, look at God, look at what Joshua has done. And Jesus steps into the picture, and he says, remove Joshua's filthy garments, and let me give him this brand new robe. And he gives him this white robe. And Joshua now is wearing Jesus' robe of righteousness. And friends, that's what Jesus wants to do with you right now. He wants to remove your filthy garments and give you a new garment. He wants to write his law on your mind. He wants to, friends, have a group of people in these last days who are saying, God, I want to follow you with all of my heart. God, I, I'm not perfect. I'm going to make mistakes. But God, please give me strength to keep my eyes upon you. And friends, the Bible talks about a, a special group of people called the 144,000. And it says that they follow the lamb 
wherever he goes. And frankly, friends, that's what Jesus wants us to do is to follow him wherever he goes. To say, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to keep your commandments. I, I don't want to have your words spoken to the Pharisees folk, spoken to me. That you never kept the will of God. I, I don't know who you are. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I don't want those words spoken to me. And friends, the beautiful thing is we don't have to right now. Right now, you can say, Jesus, I repent of my past mistakes, and I give myself to you. This is what Jesus wants to do, friends. Hebrews 10, 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and into their minds I will write them. God wants to write his law on your heart and mind in such a beautiful way that when you simply speak and act, you're acting out God's law. He wants it to be so ingrained into who you are that it's the natural thing. And right now, friends, maybe you look at your own life as you look at the laws of God and say, you know what, I need, I need some, some help. I need some assistance. More than that, I need a new heart. And Jesus says, I'll give you a new heart. I'll give you a new mind. I'll write my laws and hearts onto your mind. That's what Jesus wants to do with you tonight, friends. And I want to close our time together by telling you a true story from the year 2002 that took place to a man named Wally. Wally was a homeless man, and Wally lived in an area of town that no one wanted to go. One of my friends met Wally because of a ministry that a church was putting on for the homeless people in their city. And my friend met Wally, and the first time, in fact, that he met Wally, Wally was drunk, lying in a, a pool of, of urine. I mean, Wally had been uh, addicted to alcohol for 14 years. And, and Wally had been to every program. Uh, time and time again, he had even checked himself into different rehabilitation programs. And it seemed like none of them ever worked. Well, this church group kept on going back to Wally. They kept on feeding the homeless. They kept on loving on Wally. And after two years of that happening, it was this, as if finally Wally realized, wow, if these people can love me like this, maybe there's a God who can love me too. And this time, he checked himself into a drug and rehabilitation center. And this time, instead of relying upon himself, he surrendered his heart to Jesus for the very first time. He said, God, I can't do it. Would you please write your law on my heart and mind? Please change me. And God's grace started to work in Wally's life. Uh, Wally started to uh, act a little differently. He started using less alcohol, and he was starting to be able to interact with the group uh, better. Um, he uh, eventually actually got his own apartment and eventually got a job. And God gave him complete victory over the alcohol in his life. Another habit that he desperately wanted to give up, he'd been trying to give up for years, was, was his addiction to tobacco. And he surrendered it to Jesus. And through a stop smoking program that the church had put on, he gave up that as well. God was giving him strength to follow him. He was giving him strength to follow his law. He found uh, power over everything in his life. He wasn't perfect, but one day Wally said, you know what, God? These people have been so kind to me. I want to know more about them. And so he started studying with them, and the day came when Wally said, I want to get baptized. I want to give my life to Jesus. And as he got up there in front of that group that day, in 2002, I believe it was October 2002, he, it was actually, he got baptized at a, at a lake, if I remember my friend telling me correctly the story. And as he got up, uh, it was outdoors, he got up in front of his new church family. He told the church family this. He said, I have broken every single one of those commandments ten times over. But he said, God is writing his law on my heart and mind. And finally, I feel like I can actually, for the first time in my life, 
say, God, I'm surrendering my life to you and I'm, I'm trying to follow you with all of my heart. And he got baptized that day in that cold lake and as he came out, he told his church family, he said, you know what? I've searched my relatives for the last couple of years. I can't find them. Will you be my new family? And the church family said, yes, absolutely. And they were so excited because Wally finally had realized that same principle that we just read in Hebrews, that God was willing to change Wally from the inside out. Friends, Jesus changes lives. I could tell you story after story. I wish I could had time to tell you the story about, about Michael. Michael just got baptized this year, just recently, in the month of January. A uh, beautiful baptism at a beach down in Southern California. For nine years, Michael had been uh, wanting to walk with Jesus, but struggling to have God write his law on his mind. And he never truly surrendered, but the moment came where he let go and let God. And God took control and Michael now is walking with Jesus. He got baptized and he's following him every day. And friends, I want to let you know that Jesus can do the same thing in your life. Jesus can forget your past mistakes. He can forget your past decisions and the pain that you've caused people. And he can set you on a new path right now. He can physically take your old heart and give you a new one and say, my child, I want to give you a new life. I want to write my law on your heart and mine. So friends, I have a question for you. There's not an appeal card on the screen like our last presentation, but my question for you tonight is this. Do you want God to write his law on your heart and mind? If you do, would you just type yes into the live chat? Yes, yes, I want God to write his law on my heart and mind. Yes, I want to strive to keep God's law. Yes, I want to look through all of those Ten Commandments and find the principles and say, God, how can I follow you better? God wants to write his law on your heart and mind. He wants to change you. So will you let him, friends, tonight? Will you let him? Why don't we have a word of prayer together and ask God to write his law on our hearts and minds? Father, I, I want to say thank you so much, Lord, for these precious people. Father, I spent time today praying for each, not every one of them, Lord. There's a big list, but I want to get through all of them. That's my goal. We have a team, Lord, that's praying for, for each of these precious, precious people. And Father, you know their stories. Uh, Lord, I, I, I wish that, that we could be here and I could hear their stories and I could hear how, how you've worked in their life, how you've brought them to this moment, to this point in time, where you're calling their hearts, saying, my child, my son, my daughter, I want you. I want more of your heart. I want more of your mind. Father, I wish I could hear their stories because every single person's story is different, but you're working in their lives. Lord, just how you worked in Wally's life and Michael's life, you've worked in mine. Lord, you're working in each person's heart and mind as they're listening, Lord, to, to this live stream. And Father, I want to ask that you would write your law on our hearts and minds. Write it, Father. Help us to keep your law. Give us strength, Lord. Maybe point out to us one of the laws that we're not following. Maybe something in your word we know that's not right. Maybe, Lord, for a while there's been some sin that we're holding on to, and tonight you're saying, let go of it. It's distracting. Father, maybe there's some secret sin that no one else knows about. No one in our family, no coworker. We're the only ones. It happens behind closed doors. And tonight the Holy Spirit is speaking to someone's heart saying, my child, would you give that to me? I'll take it from you. I'll give you joy. I'll give you something better. Father, I want to have a moment of silence where each person here in the quiet of their home, with their families, wherever they're at, just in their mind, not out loud, can ask you directly to write your law on their heart and mind. Just a brief moment of silence, Lord, where each person has the opportunity to ask you to write your law on their heart. Father, I thank you so much for that silence. Lord, thank you for that silence where each, each of us could talk to you. Maybe it's been a while since we've talked to you. Maybe it's been a while, Lord, since we've prayed and opened up your word. But tonight, God is calling someone here 
A lot of people here, he's calling you to say, Lord, I want to accept your law. We love you, God. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you that you're coming soon. In your name, amen and amen. Thank you so, so, so much, friends, for, uh, for joining us. And I want you uh, to know that Jesus died on a cross for your sins. And he died on a cross for your sins. He lived a perfect life. Never once did he falter or sin. And he did it so that you could have power and strength to keep his law. He wants to write his law in your heart and mind. Will you let him, friends? Tomorrow night's presentation, Revelation's Eternal Sign of Love. Wednesday, April 15th at 7 p.m. I so hope that you can join us less than 24 hours from now at 7 p.m. And I want to mention one more thing. I almost forgot it. In the description underneath this video, you'll see there that I've included a link to a favorite song of mine, and it's called Write Them on My Heart. And I encourage you, after this live stream is done, I'm about to exit this, uh, this stage, and I encourage you to click on that link underneath the video, listen to one of my favorite songs called Write Them on My Heart. And it's uh, by a group of young people that are singing beautiful song, beautiful message, take it to home, spend some time praying with, uh, with maybe your family or by yourself and asking God to write his law on your heart and mind. We'll see you tomorrow night at 7 p.m. for Revelation's eternal sign of love. God bless. Have a great night.